about the hour, I will just take a moment once again from the Evergreen Organizing Committee to thank our sponsors for the for the conference. Our platform sponsor, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, and our captioning sponsor, Mobius. Thank you again. And so for our last session of today, I'd like to welcome uh, Jennifer Brutch, Heather Linkscold, and Katie Greenleaf Martin to present for us. Take it away. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, as she said, I'm uh, Katie Greenleaf Martin, and I am the district consultant for the Altoona District. And so I work with 13 libraries here in central Pennsylvania. I am Heather Linskold. I'm the administrative assistant for the Altoona Area Public Library and the district. And I am Jennifer Brook. I am the ILS application specialist for PALES, the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Integrated Library System, which manages and administers the Spark uh, Evergreen installation in Pennsylvania. So I want to take you through our outline for today a little bit. Uh, what we wanted to first talk a little bit about is the situations that we've encountered. So uh, we're going to hear a little bit about what the Spark Pales Consortium is and the kinds of libraries that we work with. Uh, and then we're going to look at two case studies of uh, non-pandemic related closings that happened during the pandemic for extra fun. And uh, then we will uh, talk through some of the things that we did in Evergreen that helped us handle this with grace. Some of the things that we would do differently or learned to do differently midstream uh, that helped us out. And then provide some tools and some information for how libraries can plan for these sort of things. And also what to do when the unplanned happens because you cannot plan for everything. Then we'll cover a little bit about upcoming development and some of the bugs that are in Evergreen that affect some of these features, particularly some of the newer features. And then we will ask all of you to share some things about lessons that you've learned this year and in other years about handling library closures with Grace. All right, so SPARC is a consortium of libraries in Pennsylvania that consists of about 160 library locations across 28 counties um, of our 67 counties that are in Pennsylvania, we're in 28 of them. And um, locations can be just book kiosks that don't have any people managing them to um, bookmobiles and then also multi-county cooperatives um, in that group. Um, so that's my introduction there. <laughs> Going into super detail is <laughs> not easy. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. So um, like Katie said, the Altoona Area Public Library is also the district center for a district. Um, we are the home for deliveries for resource sharing and other things, um, sorting and interlibrary loan for 13 libraries in our district. Um, we, like every other library in Pennsylvania, shut down um, for the pandemic in March of 2020. We finally reopened in June of 2020. And then on December 14th of 2020, we suffered a major flooding incident um, due to construction and a water main break. Um, it happened at about eight o'clock in the morning on December 14th, and we immediately had to shut down the library because the ground floor of our library was entirely under inches to feet of water. Um, so we have been closed since, um, we have not reopened yet due to the pandemic. They are having a hard time getting, um, parts for the things that need to be fixed. Um, so we are still closed. So we are going on almost six months, um, and we have been closed that entire time. Um, we have had no power for six weeks. So for six weeks, these are some pictures that, that Jennifer is showing. For six weeks, we had no power. We finally got power back on January 22nd. Um, we are still not able to have patrons in the building. Um, Jennifer, can you go back to the last slide so I can remember what I'm... <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks. Um, we have very limited access to the facility, so we are only able to be on the main floor of the library. We are not allowed to be on the ground floor or the um, third floor of the library. Um, we gradually started introducing services back to our patrons um, just recently. So in February, 
we opened a, a temporary secondary location in downtown Altoona in the transportation center where we are housing all of our new releases for children's teens and adults. That allows patrons to browse by appointment. Um, we are providing curbside and car side pickup at the main library. And we just most recently opened a small um, computer lab in our downtown location that has four computers for public computer use. And children's programming. And we are doing children's, oh, and we have another location at the mall in Altoona where we are doing in-person children's programming in one of the empty storefronts in the mall. Uh, yeah, so if you wanna go to back to the picture slide, Jen, so uh, you can see in that top left-hand slide, that's a sunken theater and it was a, a swimming pool. That was about 20, that picture was taken 20 minutes in to the water coming in and the water was coming into the building for about three hours before they were able to shut it off. So that's only 20 minutes worth of water that you're seeing in that top right-hand corner or top left-hand corner. Uh, and then the, uh, the other pictures are, are after the, the library was, was gutted. Was drained and gutted. Yes, Dehy they had to dehydrate it. Uh, yes. Uh, so, and the, so as Heather mentioned, the facility is, is still not open um, and the projections for the facility reopening are maybe by the end of summer, but we're already now behind that timeline. Yes. So we're just going to do whatever we can. Uh, so, you know, obviously the considerations here were, um, from my perspective, since I since I work with the library district and I coordinate interlibrary loan and resource sharing, my considerations were, okay, I have these services that I provide to other libraries that they rely on uh, to move our materials around. And so that needs to be rehomed and resituated. And uh, uh, then we have to start thinking about, you know, how we're going to uh, restart services for our patrons as well. Um, as well as, as things like mission critical services like payroll uh, and other things that just uh, have to keep happening regardless. So we're going to talk more about how we handled uh, some of those different things. The other case study that we wanted to talk about, sorry Jennifer, That's okay. um, uh, is this is a facility in eastern Pennsylvania and I do believe we have uh, some of the librarians from the Parkland Library here uh, as attendees today. So. Hello, if you're out there. Um, and this is in uh, a township complex, and they had a planned renovation project. Oh, and Easton Public, yay, okay. Hi, Marianne. <laughs> um, and so this was a, a place where there was a planned renovation, and uh, when, when the renovation began, the the renovation started to impact the library, and especially in terms of parking lots and sidewalk access to the facility before the library was actually under construction. So they ended up having to kind of shift around their timelines. This was all as the pandemic shutdown is happening. Um, so they're handling sort of multiple, uh, uh, multiple, uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the chat. We, they're handling sort of multiple factors at the same time for their closing. Our um, slides are also available on the Evergreen Conference website. Um, Jennifer Weston, if you wouldn't mind throwing that link into the chat if people are having trouble um, viewing the slides through the Hopin platform, definitely either switch your browser or the slides are uh, up as a PDF on the conference uh, website. And so feel free to check them out there as well. Uh, all, also all our, we have a ton of links later. So those will all be uh, linked from those, from the PDF slides. So uh, this library had to kind of, you know, do their shutdown at the same time as they were transitioning to a, a temporary location. And so they've got staff working at all different kinds of places. The catalogers working from home and cataloging books at home and then bringing them in. And so there's a lot, a lot of moving parts there. Um, and then their construction was scheduled to be completed in, in December, but as we all know, projects are never completed when they are scheduled to be completed. And so they have actually just moved their collections back from their temporary location and just had their soft reopen at their main facility earlier in May. So uh, it was a long journey for them and uh, they had to 
take into account a number of considerations similar to the Altoona Library as well as different ones. So I asked them uh, sort of, you know, what, what were the main kind of considerations and lessons and things going on that you guys want to share? Um, and they brought up some things that we hadn't really thought of. So they had a bigger offsite facility than we did. Heather mentioned that only the newer items and sort of higher demand items went to the temporary facility. Um, Parkland took a more significant percentage of its collection. So they had to decide what they were going to take and what they were going to leave behind. Uh, Altoona had access to its collection, so it could kind of tweak that. Parkland didn't as much. Um, and this is something that you can, to a certain extent, plan ahead for, but not something that I had been recommending to libraries that they needed to plan ahead for. Okay, so thank you, Jennifer. The link to the slides is the direct link to the PDF is in the chat. Thank you. Uh, and uh, they noted this, and this was key for us as well, staying in contact with your resource sharing regional system and in Pennsylvania district partners is key because library services are interdependent at this point and you have to keep everybody kind of in the loop. And then something that came up at both libraries uh, is book drops. And what happens when your book drop is covered in caution tape or <laughs> otherwise inaccessible um, and can uh, a lot of book drops aren't lockable. And so you, people will put stuff in them. And I think even if they are lockable, people will probably put stuff on them. Uh, so it is uh, an interesting book return situation. Um, and then also, again, working with your partners and other community locations to provide alternate book return locations. And similarly to Altoona, how will you manage deliveries and shipping? Some of those things can be rerouted to other locations. Um, some we we did we had all of our packages held and just drove to UPS and FedEx every day, several times a week. Yeah, <laughs> for twelve, eight to twelve weeks. Yeah, so was, I think it was yeah. like ten weeks. Yeah, yes. it was yes. like two months. At least. Uh, yeah. So um, and whereas uh, because they had the temporary site right away. Uh, Parkland was able to kind of have a bunch of stuff routed to uh, the secondary site, um, but, you know, not everything works that way. And so it, it always gets interesting. So that is our second case study. Uh, I do want to just pause for a minute and see if anybody has questions about the case studies. The next thing we're going to do is kind of go through some of the features in um, evergreen that either you can use. A lot of these are ones that individual libraries control for themselves in most consortia. And so a lot of these things can be done in-house. And then some of these things need to be done through support professionals like Jennifer uh, on the server side and or in, in partnership with your uh, regional consortium or however your library is set up. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to talk about, and I have linked to the documentation here, uh, is the emergency closing handler. And I know that's something that Jennifer has worked a lot on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so the emergency closing handler, um, let's see, is it like the winter of 2019 was like the first year it was available mm -hmm. to Spark Libraries and indeed in Evergreen if you were on that version. 3.3, um, I think. Um, and it was lovely for those one or two day closures, you know, when you had a snow event in Pennsylvania and other exciting things like uh, your library is blocked off because there's a race being held on the streets around it. That's happened several times. <laughs> um, so it was really great for that. Um, there are a couple of bugs with it because it is a new thing. And um, it was always intended to be kind of like a, a short term solution. But when COVID happened, we had to turn it into something a little bit bigger. Um, so it was used in Spark to basically take everything that was in Spark and uh, do after the closures and postpone it until, well, I think we started with 
sometime in um, like the end of April. Uh, that's when we started, you know, thinking, oh, maybe we'll be back by then. Um, and then some libraries also chose to backdate. And so what that meant was that they were worried about things that were due before we closed that might go into lost. And so it uh, was used to scoop up those items and carry them forward to that new due date as well. And yes, Barb, we were so optimistic <laughs> back then that it would be over so quickly. Um, in the end, uh, we shifted everything even further to July 1st. And then uh, many libraries were starting to reopen by then, but the the main challenge with uh, the Evergreen, with the, the emergency closing handler is that it just shifts everything to a single date and it doesn't scatter. So you will have some things to do after that. Um, and uh, so it's it's great for when you're first closing. So I'm, I'm gonna try and stay on topic here about when you first close, <laughs> managing, managing just that first closure. Um, so some libraries decided to, to check in items while they were closed. They were able to have one person go into the building and manage those. But of course, you know, short term, they didn't want fines to be charged. And while the emergency closing handler helps with that, what about things that are um, overdue and returned, um, you know, from before your closure and things like that. So amnesty mode as a check-in modifier was very important. Um, and then also we had different ways of managing how holds were treated depending on local relationships. So using capture local holds as a transit was also very important mm -hmm. so that when you're quarantining your items, you can have the items that came up as on hold quarantined quarantine separately from the items that were not. And they are then, you know, once they're out of quarantine, they are divert, you know, diverted to different places. Um, and One then, of the things that, that we had was that we, the place where we were checking in books had no power. So we had literally <laughs> headlamps. Yes. I should have put the picture of me we in the headlamp have. with the bar. So we had headlamps and Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots or our phones or our phones Wi -Fi hotspots. and but to we the receipt printers that we have don't play nicely with Chromebooks and we didn't have at that point like a battery inverter set up or anything so we we did we could not print anything we couldn't print hold slips we couldn't print transit slips um, I used masking tape bad librarian and wrote the the short code of the library that it needed to go to on the masking tape and put it on the book and then got a phone call from a library saying somebody put masking <laughs> tape on my books it was me it was what i had i'm sorry uh but so using the that capture local holds as transits uh, meant that no the patrons weren't notified for holds that did come in um, and we could call them and see if they wanted to pick up an on an alternate location or not, uh, but also helped us kind of group everything together that needed a slip printed since we couldn't print slips. Uh, so that that helped us out as well. That is a great point about holds. You don't want patrons to be notified that something came in at that point. <laughs> so capturing as a transit, you know, delays that whole process and it's wonderful. Um, and then pausing holds and resource sharing. So um, making your library not a pickup location only fixes the issue for new holds when patrons go to place a hold after you are closed. It doesn't fix the holds that are already in place. Um, so you have to also freeze holds that are uh, with your location as a pickup location. And then uh, if you don't want your items sharing out during that time, you can add age hold protection that keeps them from, you know, transiting outside of your branch. And um, and then after that, you have to think about how you're communicating all of this with your patrons. Um, and so during COVID, we got very fancy with our OPAC maintenance messages. Um, we also, when we were doing the reopening process, we created a new email notice that targeted those postponed due dates that were, um, in most cases, I tried to make sure that they were at least 30 days in the future and said, 
guess what? Your library is reopening. Here's what you do, and this is what you have checked out. Um, so it just kind of scooped up everything that was checked out, you know, to a patron and uh, let them know that, you know, their library was reopening when and what they needed to do if they wanted to return items. No rush. Definitely underscoring no rush <laughs> because uh, many of the libraries weren't in a position to accept a huge flood of items due within a short you know, time span, which is kind of what happens with the emergency closing handler is that everything that's normally spread out and due over the course of months is suddenly all condensed down to one day. Um, and then uh, you can evaluate whether or not you want to turn off or edit your lost notices and processes and things like that. It was a mixed bag with the Spark libraries as to what they decided to do. And then one of the really important things is to uh, divert your patrons to another location um, in your OPEC if possible, because you don't want your OPEC to just say you're closed and then be empty um, <laughs> um, of content, because um, that can be a little scary and it can mean that patrons never return to it because it will seem very, you know, doomsday scenario. Um, so if you're in a resource sharing group, where your patrons can go to another member library. Um, you can rescope your OPEC to a higher system level, which we had uh, done with uh, Parkland in that case. They were part of a, a member uh, cooperative of, you know, uh, 10 other libraries. So theirs was scoped to the, to the system level and their patrons just was able to see everything that was across the whole system. And uh, that way there was still content on their OPEC. Um, and then you can make your location not OPEC visible, um, but it can be confusing to patrons um, if your location just suddenly disappears. And it doesn't change the fact that if they log into the OPEC, that's still their home library. Um, <laughs> and it can still come up as their preferred library um, when searching and things like that. So that can be something where you kind of want to evaluate the patron experience there. Um, so that's um, things that uh, we often do when you first have a closure, and that's just with the ILS. Um, some other things that you might want to consider uh, when you first close is, um, I don't know, Kami, Kami you want to jump in here. Um, mm -hmm. How do you still issue library cards? Um, oh, yeah. And we are going to talk about that. Heather, Heather issues <laughs> the library, library cards. Okay. Heather, Maybe Heather, 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 <laughs> if we looked at the number of library cards created in the Blair County Library System this year, I think 75% of them would be her workstation <laughs> because she did them for the whole system during the pandemic. Ah, but yeah, okay. we are, we have that in another slide to talk about um, patron registration. Um, and uh, there was, so, oh, so uh, from from the chat, uh, there is not right now a way to make um, amnesty mode uh, or any other check-in modifiers, I don't think, uh, happen over SIP. So for those of you with uh, self, uh, well, I guess you wouldn't have self check-in stations, but anybody with an automated materials handler uh, and or machine overlords, as a, as a friend of mine calls them, um, then that that is a, a challenge there. So that's something to think about, uh, both in terms of development and also uh, as you're considering your workflows, uh, if you are a library that has an automated uh, system like that, you know, that's obviously going to, to change your workflows. In our case, we didn't have power, so it wouldn't have worked anyway. Um, was there anything else in the chat? I don't think there was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to do you want to talk? Um, I think we did already talk about um, checking in items well closed, um, and then parts of your collections are inaccessible. So, uh, say in the case of Katie's library, there were parts of their collection that just couldn't be circulated anymore because they couldn't get to them. So yep. you can... They're still, they're still in the next county. Yes. <laughs> um, so you can change parts of your collection via shelving location properties to be holdable or not holdable and 
visible or not visible on the OPEC um, so that you can keep patrons from looking for something that they really can't get their hands on right now. Um, and then the uh, before the pandemic, we did not have very many Spark libraries that were using the patron self-registration module in the OPEC. Um, but adoption of that process uh, after COVID is much higher and satisfaction with it is also much higher. Um, but they have also mentioned that they need a workflow for renewal of library cards um, as well. So that is, you know, something that I'll be, you know, looking into in the future. Um, and of course, the welcome email is the wonderful part of the automation that just sends patron a notice when they have their new account and what the info is. Yeah. So our workflow for patron expiration um, is that we use reports to find <coughs> patrons who are ex uh, expiring within a date range while we're closed. And we did this um, for a number of our libraries. Um, particularly, we had libraries in my district. Oh, and I'll talk about identity valid validation because that's a, a good question. Um, we had libraries in my district that migrated within the last three years from ILS is where they're either their patrons didn't have expiration dates or their expiration dates did not transfer over. So their expiration dates were all the three year anniversary of their migration and that fell during the COVID shutdown for a number of my libraries. So what we did was to run report and, and I think they did this uh, spark wide for during the some of the shutdown um, and we did it a little bit more afterwards is um, we ran a report to get those uh, patron barcode numbers and then we used uh, user buckets to be able to bump those out to after the libraries would, would be reopening. Um, and, and yeah, and that was something that, that we could do, you know, from home or from, from an alternate site. Uh, then the way that we handle patron registration online is that we do actually physically make them a card when they turn in the patron registration form. We had, all of my libraries had used the form previously, but patrons had to come in and say, I registered myself, I pre-registered online, and then the staff would pick up from there. What we started doing during the shutdown was staff, Heather, took home a box of library cards and uh, as patrons registered, then she created a barcode for them. Uh, wrote you wrote their name wrote on the their card, name on the back of the card, and then they were emailed uh, the card number, so they could use it for our electronic resources. Uh, these patrons then would have to come in and show ID in order to get the physical card, and they would have to do that in order to check out physical items. So we were essentially not doing address validation for di digital only cards, if right. you will, um, so that they could use the various library resources. Then if they want to use the physical library resources, that's the point at which we do address validation. There are some libraries in our consortium where the way they do it is they make you a library card and mail it. And so your address validation is if you get the library card at the mail at the address you said you lived at, then congratulations, we've validated your address. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. so uh, Cambria does that, and uh, I believe Lackawanna County uh, Scranton Public Library, that's what they do as well. So it's uh, it's very low tech <laughs> address validation via mail carrier, uh, but uh, that that is one option as well. We've had good success with uh, just hanging on to the cards, and, and if people wanna pick them up, great. If they just wanna use digital services, then that's great too. Um, and so those are how we handled those things. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Jennifer, if you want to jump back in with, uh, holds management. Okay. So gradually restarting holds, um, one of the first considerations is to decide if you're going to set up in a temporary location and if you need to change the pickup location um, for the holds that are currently in the system that you have frozen. Um, if you are just going to um, 
divert them to another library, a partner library, for example, you can go into the database and change the pickup location for those frozen holds and uh, voila, it's wonderful. Um, but if you're not going to do that, then the other option is that you can take your location that you already have in there and rename it to say temporary location at so-and-so place. And um, so it's, it's kind of a way to, um, I don't know the word, Katie, but <laughs> to just take your location. A way and, to communicate to people that they should not go to the location that they're used to going to. Right. So it's um, changing the, and this is actually on the next slide. Um, yeah. Uh, changing the uh, the name of the location, new address and phone number, hours of operation, changing all of that to reflect that you are in a new temporary location. And you can communicate that with your patrons via the notifications and action triggers, because if you have your coding in your notices right, that information just translates in. You don't have to edit your notices yeah. at all if you have the coding in there that is actually fetching the data from the database. And we, um, we encountered something interesting with this, which is that because we um, now have two, we have one branch that has two hold pickup locations, we elected at this time not to create a new org unit for our temporary location, but we're offering hold pickup at both locations uh, so that we are handling this old school and just calling everybody and asking them what they do and what they want to do and writing it on the slip. Um, uh, but without creating another organizational unit uh, for another location uh, that, that can be tricky in terms of how you're going to handle items and pick up and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then after you've made a decision to uh, how to handle your frozen holds, then you can unfreeze them. Um, but then before you get crazy, you know, looking at that pull list, you should really look at what's currently on your hold shelf. Um, you know, one of the frustrations with COVID is that a lot of libraries went home and in some cases they had hundreds of books waiting on shelves in the library to be delivered to patrons when they reopened. And some of them were like, I just wish I could get them into the hands of patrons now. And some of them mailed them. They just said, you know what? We're just going to get it out of the library and we're just going to mail it to each of these patrons expensive as heck um but it got it done and um when you come back um you do have to clear that hold shelf by deciding are you going to contact each of the patrons um to ask them what they want to do do they still need it it's been you know who knows how long they might have <laughs> bought it um, or gotten it at another library or, you know, things like that. Um, and do they want it at another pickup location if you have, you know, partner locations where they can, you know, go to instead? Or do they just want to go back on the list for later because now is not a good time? Right. Um, yeah. And so. <laughs> uh, we did kind of a combination of, of those things. Um, we had one library in my, one library system in my district uh, actually did home delivery during the pandemic. So that was one of their, one of their workarounds was to, instead of mailing them home to the patrons to physically take them to the patrons' homes. Um, I wanted to know, and I'm curious, uh, Gina, um, they, she said they had a library pick up their, customize their hold slips with alias names for curbside pickup. So you had, you, you used the uh, hold, holds alias field, um, and just to designate where where they wanted their items to be picked up. And while I'm letting Gina type her answer to that, I will read, I uh, just wanted to read another comment from someone here that says, um, ended up creating a new patron type that allows patrons to access e-resources, but doesn't allow for circulation of physical items. And so the patrons get, they get their card, they get mailed their card, but they have to show, still then show their ID in order to have their patron type changed. So that's another nice workaround for um, requiring that address validation uh, and not having a box of library cards sitting in your library, which, which we have now. Uh, so that's, that's cool. Um, and there are, you know, we've done um, uh, some hefty customs to our, our various slips. One of our, one of our things is, um, regardless of what the patron selects in terms of notification preferences, we have to call them. 
And so forcing having the, the hold slip print their phone number all the time instead of selecting the data to print based on what the patron selected was one of the customizations that we made um, so that they can they can see uh, they, that information is on there for the CERC staff instead of having to pull that patron up again. Yep. And so after you've cleared your hold shelf, your staff and your patrons have an opportunity to communicate with each other about what their needs really are while you're trying to figure out how to deliver holds while you're closed or partially reopened. And so that's your opportunity to figure out, hey, you need more information on your receipts and you need to start um, you know, collecting different types of, of information um, during the holds process, you need to start storing things differently or, you know, things like that, so that when you do start finally doing that pull list, you have that process ironed out. And so after that, if the uh, emergency closing handler dates are still active and saying that you are a closed location, you will need to go into your library settings to turn on the settings that allow your holds pull list to populate even while you are closed. Because normally that is not the case. Um, if your library is closed on a Sunday, the holds pull list is not being uh, populated and targeted um, during a time that you were closed. Um, and that helps, you know, with, um, you know, cases where you have libraries that are closed on different days of the week, but they have a hold that would best fit for, you know, that hold to be, you know, targeted to. Um, it's just that the targeter is going to say, hey, they're closed right now, so I'm going to skip this day and try again, you know, the next day. Um, we're turning that off in the case of a closure so that the pool list is always um, being populated and the books are being targeted. Um, there is a bug um, that if you have a unique item that you are the only library whose item can fill the hold, it will show up on your pull list even if you are closed. It's a known bug. Normally, not a problem. It's only like one or two items. But during a long-term closure, it becomes a bit longer of a list. So don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should have had a don't panic slide. We should that have is had a what this presentation is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see. We've gone through some of these parts a little bit. Um, but it once you no start way. to to partially like, reopen, you can uh, mess with your OPAC again to rescope it to your location and make the location OPEC visible again and also designate it as a pickup location, etc. And then the final part, if you have, you know, some semi-regular hours again where people can access you, that's when you turn off the holds targeting while closed settings. And you're almost back to normal at that point. And what we did was combining those, the, the changing the shelving location properties with so we we made all of our shelving locations unholdable then uh turned the pull list back on then started turning on shelving locations as they became available to us so we were we used that uh to stage it mm -hmm. all right so uh, some suggestions for what we can do to plan ahead better in the future. What have we learned? So uh, Jen is going to take us through a, a really great slide that she has made about creating a disaster plan and who and what and when and where. Um, but just a, a couple of thoughts that I had as I was thinking back about the past year um, is that one of the things that's often not in a business interruption plan or a disaster plan or anything like that is what about the ILS? Um, it, you know, you're, you're focused on safety and con continuity of, of business operations, but what about continuity of operations for patrons? Um, and so those are the kind of things that, that you do need to think about and have a plan um, ahead for who's going to uh, do the OPAC maintenance message, you know, who's going to, going to turn off the holds targeter. Um, and so making sure that that part of it is included 
Uh, then obviously there are a ton of business operations questions uh, about paying staff and who's going to do what and who's going to work from where. Always plan to be closed longer than you think. When the when on the day that our flood happened, they said we would be open by the end of the week. <laughs> For those of us who were there, <laughs> I we was, knew that was not going to happen. That was five and a half months ago, and we have no yeah. no end date in sight. Um, and make sure your community your communications plan includes not only your staff but also your stakeholders. Uh, local government, local funders, libraries you resource share with, um, and everyone from the knitters to the election officials who use your library. Um, when you have a longer closure than a couple of days, you got to keep those people in the loop. Okay, so... Um... I created this slide when I let myself have some coffee and think about my experiences um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, just a little bit of background info. When the pandemic started and libraries were closing in Pennsylvania, I was still working at one of the Spark member libraries as a reference librarian. And I occasionally have some moments of like, this is going to be so much worse than people think it is. And I was, I was really thinking we need to do some things. And um, it didn't happen because we all, you know, people around me were, were just kind of thinking, nah, we'll be back in like two weeks. Um, and so, you know, two weeks later, I wasn't working there anymore, and I was working with Spark, and I was hearing from libraries and Spark who were, like, thinking now about the same things that I was, and they don't, they didn't have access to their buildings anymore, and they couldn't get the things that they needed to start operating from home or remotely um, anymore. And um, a lot of those things included technology. It is... Um, always important to make sure that your staff, if they're going to be not working on location for any period of time, that they have access to something that helps them do what they need to from home. Um, so some of those things, um, you know, are outlined here basically from my experience of what I set up for people before uh, we closed and, um, and then before I, I left that library to, to go to Spark. Um, so one of the really important things here is a pocket response plan. It's called PREP and there is a link to it here in the <laughs> uh, presentation here. And I'll just kind of go to it real quick. It's, it's done by the Council of State Archivists. It's adorable. It's basically two page, two pages long. It's a one sheet piece of paper, both sides are filled out, you fold it into this accordion and it will fit in your wallet. And um, it has contact numbers, what to do in certain situations. Um, and it includes, you know, what to do for your ILS and things like that. It has some suggestions on how to fill it out here. And ah, I just, I love that thing. So um, yeah. Uh, so, in my opinion, all of your staff should have that um, after my experiences is that if they don't have one on their little ID cards, that they have one in an accessible place um, that's not at their desk. So it has to be accessible online for them remotely at the very least and things like that um, so that they can get to it if they if something happens while they're not in the building. Um, and so things that the, the pocket response plan can do can tell staff on the front lines who to call and when for certain situations, because inevitably this stuff happens when your administration staff, the people who make these decisions aren't there. <laughs> like, so our, the executive director at the Altoona library was, I believe on a college visit. She was with, on a college with visit her with her senior daughter. Yes. Um, and staff was were kind of coming into the to the building and their 
some very funny stories, which I don't have time for now, but it was mm -hmm. just quite a, mm -hmm. quite and, a morning. And that is very true that this stuff happens when your administrative staff is not there because it is a long running joke at the Altoona Library that all of the very bad things happen when our director is not in the building. <laughs> yes. And um, so that was the, the case for me where, you know, COVID was starting and I was getting back into the building to set things up for people to work remotely from home, but nobody important was there. <laughs> so how do I communicate with these people? Um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that is, is very important to have guidance and a framework in place for when department heads and your administration staff are not there. And then the in-depth uh, disaster plan, which has all of those extra details about, you know, what do you do if your d collection is damaged after a fire or a flood and things like that should be accessible, of course, to all of your department heads. And it should be online and it should be in the trunk of your car and, <laughs> and all these fun places. And um, it should have contacts for your vendors, utilities, your services like UPS and USPS and all these people to contact to say, so don't bring our packages to this building anymore. Um, bring them here instead or do this so that you can call them day of or day after this happens because the sooner you can get that fixed, the better. Um, I did have some stories of libraries where they discovered that USPS just kept delivering their stuff and put it at their front door for a day or two. And uh, that was that. a little scary. Yep. Until eventually, you know, they put a note on the door saying, you know, we'll, we'll store these for you, but, you know, do something. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we had to seriously consider was also paying staff if they're continuing to work from home or even if they're not working from home during a situation like this where it is not their fault that they are out of work potentially. Um, so how long can you continue to pay your staff? Do you? Um, do you lay them off instead? Um, some considerations need to be in the plan there as well. Um, okay, and then the actual kits themselves um, that I outline here are just kind of some things where you still need to do payroll, whether you are laying people off or not, you're not gonna lay off your director. So payroll still needs to happen. I had a library do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's a different um, story for a different day. And um, preferably you don't want all of that uh, employee data to be on a personal device. So you want to issue the people who are doing the administrative work a library workstation so that they have access to their necessary software and all those passwords and data is kept contained on a separate device that you regain control of after the situation is passed. Um, and then, you know, if you need payroll supplies like the fancy paper for your checks and, you know, stamps for the little signatures and, you know, those fun things to consider. Um, Instructions for recording the phone for changing the phone recording of your library. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Um, you know, forwarding phone calls. If you have the ability with your phone system to forward phone calls, you can send them out to a library issued phone that you give your staff to say, you don't have to call out using your personal phone. We'll, f you know, send your your phone calls to to this device instead. Um, and then, you know, that's especially important for the circulation and the reference staff, where if they're doing operation from home, um, you are not giving a personal phone number to one of those patrons who loves you so much they want to take you home forever uh, <laughs> because you're so wonderfully helpful. I have a few of those. And, um, <laughs> you know, so um, you don't want your staff feeling uncomfortable like they have to go into a witness protection program after <laughs> this situation has passed because their personal lives have been exposed to your patrons. So library issued phone and device very very important um, during this time. <laughs> and um, yeah, 
Oh, that is good, Josh. Grasshopper service. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I think we have a lot of um, advice that uh, we can get from our our attendees here about that situation because we were, uh, I think a lot of us were caught off guard and learned a few things here. <laughs> yeah. Our, in the, in Altoona situation, their VoIP server didn't have power. Yeah, we we had no so had, phones. There the, was no the whole time there the was no phones. Yeah. yeah. And then I will warn people that if you have that situation where your phones have been shut off um for a long time, do not do not have them turned back on until you are ready to answer those phone calls. So when the power came back on, the phones immediately started ringing off the hook. And three of us were standing in the middle of the library with eight phones ringing off the hook going, oh, my God, we can't answer any of these phones yet. And so we actually had the phone company um, turn the service off for a little bit until we were ready to actually start answering phones again. <gasps> yeah, it was, it was overwhelming. The minute the power came on, those phones started ringing off the hook. It All right. Was... We're, uh, we're just about at time. So I want to make sure that I've thanked uh, everybody for being here with us today and Jennifer Weston for her lovely moderation services. Um, this last slide is a picture of the, the Altoona mayor with our temporary, the sign at the building that has our temporary site. There are always silver linings and uh, find them, use them, make them work for you long term. Um, because you have to find a way to have some good out of it or you just cry all the time and that's not helpful. So uh, I hope this has been useful and good for everybody. I know uh, Jen Brooke has a little bit of time to stick around and answer some more questions. Heather and I are at a, uh, a board meeting that starts at six, so we are headed out. Thank you all so much. Uh, the slides are up on the conference website and don't hesitate to reach out to any of us if you wanna talk more about any of this. Oh, and yeah. And Jennifer will do buttons. Okay, perfect. This, this is the slide. Bye, um, <laughs> Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. <laughs> Um, so this is the slide that contains the bugs that we kind of ran into during this process, and we would love it if you would add heat to them. The top batch of bugs is related to placing holds once your location is no longer available as a pickup library. And the top two that I have placed in bold are especially important. It would be really nice if when your patron is trying to place a hold and your location is their pickup library by default because that's their home library or because they filled it in in their user settings, that it didn't silently fail, that it gave them an error message that they need to pick up a new location, um, you know, to select a new pickup location. And uh, so those bugs would be a wonderful improvement for this process. And then of course, the next list is related to the emergency closing handler. Yes, yes, curbside scheduling separate from open hours. That is on the list, I believe. Or no, that is um, that is in our curbside presentation that will be tomorrow, actually, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> um, but it, it is, um, I think there's another bug that talks about uh, complicated closings and hours for locations that would be helpful for that as well. Okay. And so I think that is about it. You're welcome, Tani. Yeah, I was going to add that you had a uh, new libraries coming on in the midst of all this too, didn't you, Jennifer? Yes, At we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're a warrior, so. <laughs> okay. Well, as far as for moderating, my job here is just to thank you one more time and to thank you for sharing your experiences so perhaps others don't have to. Thank you. There's some really yeah, great resources in there, too. Um, well, like I said, the slides are already up, so if anybody wants to share this slide so you can ask other people to add heat that perhaps weren't able to attend today, please do that as well because these are some really important bugs to gain attention. I think that's it for today. We'll pick up tomorrow, a new day of the conference, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Everyone have a good evening. You as well. Bye. Bye.